doctor. Um, she's a, one of those very clever people. It's great having a, a doctor friend in your phone book, on your phone. But 18 months ago, she actually left her practice and has come on full time to lead View Church Table View with Andre. So it was a real faith step, but it's just been the most incredible season for them. And so can I encourage you, open your heart to hear what this woman has to say because she has gold inside of her. Good morning, church. Are you guys good? So good to be with you guys. Um, I said to the first service, Cheslin pretty much stole everything I wanted to say because, um, yeah, Simon and her have really become amazing friends to Andre and I. Our children get on so well. And, um, yeah, we love your church. We love your church. We love your leadership. We love your staff. You guys are blessed with amazing leaders. Do you know that? You've got phenomenal leaders. So if this is your house and you are planted here, you are in good hands. But, um, yeah, we first met, I think we met Fiona and, um, and Sassy, um, and, geez, years ago. They came to speak at a, a women's conference for us um, at, at View Church. And then the, the friendship and the connection happened. And we've just loved connecting with you guys ever since. But um, I'm going to jump into the message this morning, and um, I heard that you guys have been doing a series about building, is that right? About building your life with the right foundations and um, how to build strong. And so I then did a little bit of snooping, and I went onto your website, and I saw that one of your core values in this church is unity. Am I right? And I thought, wow, if you're going to build a solid foundation, um, you need unity, what a powerful, effective tool to build a solid life. What a powerful, effective tool to build a solid church. Amen? So if you're taking notes, the title of the sermon this morning is The Power of Unity. But we're going to start off just by praying. Is that good? Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are here. We thank you that you want to move this morning, God. You want to speak to every one of our hearts. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak directly to me and through me. I pray for a, sp a spirit of wisdom and revelation in this room. I pray, God, that none of us will leave you the same unchanged by you, God, that you will move each and every one of us, that you'll speak to us directly. And all of God's people said, amen. Awesome. So I wanted to ask a question. Is there anybody in the house this morning who enjoys hosting uh, get-togethers, who enjoys hosting dinner parties? Okay, we've got some. Okay, awesome. You enjoy having people around. Have you ever had an experience where you get a whole bunch of your friends over and you're having the most amazing time, four or five hours fly past, so much fun, the dessert's been eaten, all the children are there too, and now it's about two hours after their normal bedtime, and the kids start to implode. And the parents do what, what any normal person would do. They kind of grab the kids under their arm and make a dash for it before there's a full-on meltdown. Have you seen that happen? And everyone kind of makes a run for the, for the front door, and a part of you is a bit relieved because, you know, the chaos is clearing. Um, but you kind of look around your house, and you go, Oh, my hat, my house is trashed. You know that feeling? Like every single mug I own is dirty. Every plate I own is filthy. There is chocolate cake crumbs in my carpet. There's chocolate icing on my white walls. You can hear by the level of detail I've lived this. And you start to think, I'm going to be cleaning all weekend. Like, there goes my weekend. Like, my house is never going to look the same again. I'm going to be scrubbing for the next 48 hours. And then all of a sudden, like angels sent from heaven itself, two couples stay behind and they just start to tackle the house with you. One couple takes the dishes, they start packing the dishwasher. The other couple gets the mop and the broom, they start sweeping. You and your husband start digging in. And before you know it, what looked like the biggest task, the most daunting task, is done just like this. Have you guys ever experienced that? 
And can we be honest, in that moment, those two couples that stayed behind, you decide, are your BFFs for life? And they will be at every single party you throw from then on. Amen. It's happened to me. And the point I want to make from that is that unity is powerful. We are so much better together. Many hands made light work. And we were never, ever meant to do life alone. It's not the way that God planned it. So I've, I've been around church for a long time. I actually, geez, my dad became a pastor when I was three. So I'm a PK. And I've been in the church a lot, and I've fallen asleep in many worship meetings under the chairs, and I've been on so many church camps. And the thing I've learned over the years, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but what I've learned over the years is that there is no such thing as a perfect church. It doesn't exist. Why is that? Because the church is made up of imperfect, flawed people. So if you're looking for a perfect church, you're never going to find it. You'd have to kick out all the people, and then it wouldn't be a church. So there's no such thing as a perfect church. And I think something we have to settle in our hearts as Christians is that there's no perfect leader. And at some point, we're going to be let down. It's just part of life. You hang around me long enough, I'm going to disappoint you because I'm an imperfect, flawed human being. And I mean, if you're, a, if you're a bit of a perfectionist or a control freak, that can be quite a hard thing to deal with. But it's something we just have to get our head around. Hey, we are flawed. Does that mean we throw in the towel and we just give up? No. We say, I'm going to wake up every morning and I'm going to go to God and I'm going to ask Him for help. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. I'm going to pray that every day as I spend time with God, I get a little bit more like Jesus and I'm going to carry on with this mission that God's given me because we are called to fulfill a mission, an eternal mission. None of us are just here on earth by accident. And I want to say this, whether you believe it or not, every single one of you sitting here this morning has an eternal purpose on their life. God has a specific plan for you, an eternal plan for you. You weren't meant to just come to earth, live for 80 plus years, pay off the bond, you know, get your kids an education and then die. You were planned, uh, you, you were planned with a purpose that is meant to change eternity. Amen? And so for that reason, we keep going. We keep pushing. I'm going to say a lot of things this morning, but if there's one thing that I could ask you guys to remember, it would be this. The devil is not afraid of a big church. He's afraid of a unified church. And I'm going to elaborate on that a lot more later. But I want you guys to remember that. The devil is petrified of a church which is full of people with one vision who are cheering each other on to reach their world for Jesus. That to him is terrifying. We're going to quickly jump back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at the book of Exodus. And we're at the place in the story where... The the Israelites have been freed from slavery in Egypt. God has parted the Red Sea. He has taken care of them. And now they're supposed to be in the promised land. But because of their own disobedience and unbelief, they are now stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. You guys are familiar with the story, right? So they are stuck in the wilderness. And what God says to Moses is he says, I want you to build me the tabernacle. Okay, there's a picture of the tabernacle. And this was going to be the dwelling place of God on earth amongst the Israelites. And you can see this is a pretty big structure. 
And if you go and read the Old Testament, God was so specific. He actually says, I want all the people to bring their gold, bring their precious stones, bring all of their resources together. And he says, I actually want this person who's got this gift to come and make this part for me. And this person who's got this gift to make this part. I want the curtains to be this thick, made out of this material. The, the lists go on. It's crazy. What am I trying to get at? This tabernacle could never have been built by one person and their resources. But it took the Israelites coming together in unity, all working together to see this tabernacle built. What's even more crazy about the tabernacle was that it had to be portable. And you can see on the far left, that's the size of an American football field. And this is meant to be drawn to scale, just to give you an idea of the size of the tabernacle. And wherever the Israelites moved, the tabernacle came with. Can you do that on your own? No. It takes unity. It takes people working together. And you know, of course, the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God, the church. We're God's house in 2019, aren't we? This is the the house of the Lord. Just like in those days, if we're going to build a healthy church that changes the nation, we have to come together in unity. What's impossible for one man is possible with unity. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. Come on, you've all heard that, right? We are the body of Christ. So some of you are a hand, some of you are a foot, some of you are a knee. We're all different organs. But if the body is going to be healthy and effective, we all need to be playing our part. Amen? All of us. Cheslin mentioned I am a medical doctor. So I know a little little bit about anatomy and physiology, um, are there any runners in the room? Anyone, anyone who likes to run? Awesome. We've got a runner, another runner. We've got a few. Okay. Have any of you ever tried to run a marathon with a really bad middle ear infection? Awesome. I'm proud of you. Don't ever do that. Because I want to tell you, you might be the, the fittest person on the planet. You might have the biggest calves, the most muscular arms. You might be so fit. But if you try and run that marathon with the really bad middle ear infection, you are going to end up looking like a drunken soldier. You're going to run into trees. You might hit a car. Why am I saying that? Your middle ear is your balance center. Seriously, as a GP, I had patients who we had to book off driving, off work for a week because they were so dizzy and disorientated from that middle ear infection. What am I trying to say to you guys? For the body to work effectively, everybody has to play their part. We can't just have really big, strong calf muscles but no balance For this church to be healthy, everybody's got to come to the party. And that's why if you haven't done growth track, come on, you've got to do growth track. Because that growth track, it's all about discovering your gifts, your purpose. They say there's two great days in the world, the day you were born and the day you found out why. And when you discover your gifts, you find out what was I born for? What was I called to? What role do I play in the body? And then once you know, you can join a serving team. I, I, I keep on forgetting how long your stage is. It's a, quite a walk back. Again, connect groups. Hey, we push them at View Church. Because in a connect group, you're going to build relationships. And we're so much better together. We were never called to do life in isolation. Never. We're so much better together. And you know, I know what it's like. Sometimes you say, I'm so busy. I don't have time for another thing in the week. Like, help me, Jesus. I just want to rest. I need rest. I'm busy. Does that sound familiar? I always say to our church, the busier you are, the more crazy your life is, the more you need to be in a connect group because you need people praying for you. You need people who have your back. And when I was in medical school, it was one of the toughest seasons of my life. 
Um, I made a commitment, though, that I was not going to stop serving the church. And I said, I'm going to run. We call them view groups. You call them connect groups. I'm going to run a view group throughout medical school, which was six years. And it was just a conviction I had. And so I can remember being post-call. That's, you've done a 30-hour shift. You don't sleep. We were delivering babies. I mean, there's, there's no beds for the students to sleep anyway. I actually tried to sleep on a linen shelf once. Like, I was so desperate. Um, but I would come home at 1 p.m. after being there since 7 a.m. the day before. I would have a really good shower. Like, you know, delivering babies is messy, in case you didn't know that. And then I would go to sleep, but I would set my alarm for three hours' time, and I would wake up so I could go and run my view group. And I wasn't trying to be a martyr. I needed my view group. They prayed for me. They had my back. They carried me through. You know, we had to deliver a certain amount of babies. And if you had a quiet night, it was like, well, sorry, pick up another call. But they used to pray that when I was on call, the babies would pop out. And the babies would pop out. Seriously. Like, you cannot outgive God. If you put God first, you don't come second. He's faithful. But I had a conviction that I was not going to become obsessed with medicine. I was going to serve his house first. And God was good to me. When I had exams, I would, you know, I had friends who were cleverer than me, um, who, who wouldn't go to their view group or whatever, and they thought I was nuts. But God gave me favor. And I got better marks than I should have got. I wasn't being lazy. I wasn't going to view, view group because I didn't want to study. I was going because I had a conviction that I want to serve God. I want to put Him first. You can never outgive God. Can we just make a deal this morning? I want to make a deal with you guys that nobody here, sitting here this morning, is going to be an appendix. Is that a deal? You can be any other organ, but nobody is allowed to be an appendix because the appendix is the only organ in the body that has no function. It just sits there. It does nothing. None of you guys are called to be an appendix. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. We have no idea what this little organ is there for. They've done so much research. It sits here in the right lower quadrant of your abdomen. And, you know, appendix, like I say, it does nothing. But it makes us nervous as doctors. Because as it just sits there quietly, sometimes it becomes infected. And then it can burst and rupture and spread sepsis throughout the body. It's weird. And I think sometimes when you just sit in church and you don't get involved and you don't do anything, you can also get a little bit septic, spread a little bit of poison. None of us in this room were created to be an appendix. Is that a deal? Amen. So when I was in medical school, I also used to do quite a bit of babysitting to earn some extra money. And... um, Yeah, I think people trusted me because I was a med student and they would leave these tiny little babies with me. And most of the time, these babies would just sleep right through. So it was easy money. And I always used to think, you know, I used to think, sure, um, I don't know these people at all and they're trusting me with their baby. Um, But then I would like, I would look around the house and I would try and decide what kind of people they were. I, I was not creepy. I didn't open drawers or anything like that. I'm just saying. But I would look at the house and I would... You know, I could tell a lot about the type of family just from looking at their house. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you came to my house, you would see an espresso machine, and you'd see some pods, and you'd go, okay, well, someone in this house likes coffee. My husband really likes coffee. Then you would see, uh, like, probably two or three pink and purple netball balls lying around the house, and you'd go, okay, well, there's probably little girls that live here who love netball. And they also love to swim. So you'd probably find goggles, you know, hanging on every... A countertop, and, and you go, okay, there's probably little girls, Olivia, who like swimming, you know? You can see this stuff from a person's house. You'd see family photos everywhere, and you'd go, okay, well, they obviously value family. So where you live tells a story. It tells people something about you. You guys agree with me? Looking back at the picture of the tabernacle, which was the dwelling place of God, it was God's house, there's actually a lot of things we can learn about God just by looking at that. I, don't, I want to point out three quickly. The first thing we can learn about God from the tabernacle is that He is holy. Okay, What does it mean to be holy? 
It means to be set apart. Our God is holy. He is set apart. You know, in that tabernacle, you'll see right at the back, um, there's an area. It was called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And it, it was set apart. And even the actual tabernacle itself, it was always put apart from the camp. In fact, it goes on to my next point, but all the tribes of Israel would actually camp around the tabernacle, but the tabernacle itself was set apart. So you're with me. Our God is holy. He is set apart. Second point we can observe, I just alluded to it. The tabernacle needed to be in the center. Our God's rightful place is always at the center at the center of our lives. So the Israelites would encamp around and make his home the center. In our lives, Jesus needs to be the center. He's our reason. He's our motivation. He's our why. He's our message. Amen? And the third thing that we can learn is that our God is merciful. You need to remember, church, that the Israelites had been freed from captivity. God had parted the Red Sea. He'd given them food, manna. He'd done so much for them. And they still didn't have the faith to believe him for the promised land. So because of their disobedience and their lack of trust, they are stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. What does our God do? He says, if you're in the wilderness, I'm going to be in the wilderness. And he gets them to build a tabernacle so that he can dwell with his people in the wilderness. Come on. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And he chooses to be with his people in the wilderness. He is rich in mercy. And I want you guys to know, even in your toughest seasons, when you feel like you're going through a wilderness, when you feel like you're all alone, you are never alone. The God that we serve is with you in the wilderness. He was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was in the boat with the disciples when they thought they were going to drown. We serve a God who promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He is rich in mercy. I love the story of Mary Magdalene. She was an ex-prostitute. She had seven demons cast out of her. But she repents and she gives her life to Jesus and they bond and she becomes, you know, a real follower of Jesus. She was a woman that was shown a lot of mercy, agreed? And then I think it's so appropriate that when Jesus dies on the cross to pay the price for your sins and my sins, for the sins of the world, He dies on the cross, and then he rises from the grave. The tomb is empty, and it's like all of a sudden, mercy is unleashed on a whole nother level. Would you agree? All of a sudden, the Bible says that curtain in the tabernacle tore. We no longer needed to bring burnt offerings. We no longer needed a priest. You and I can come into the presence of our God. Everything changed when Jesus rose from the grave. And how appropriate that Mary Magdalene was the first person to arrive and to see that. Someone who had been given and shown so much mercy. I think it's beautiful. Mercy was released in a whole nother, to a whole nother level. And you know, we say this a lot at U Church, but we say we want to be known as a church for what we are for, not what we are against. So we say, what are we for as a church in unity? What are we for in unity? And that's what we want the world to know us for. Because for too long, the church has been known for what they are against. Am I right? Everyone can tell you the church is against, it used to be against tattoos or against loud music. Um, Or at one point it was against uh, even bikinis. My mom always says when she got saved, you were going to hell on roller skates if you wore a bikini. And 
the church has always it's been known for what it's against, but we want to be known for what we are for. At View Church, we want someone to go, hey, what are you guys for? Hey, we're for what our God is for. And what is he for? Well, we just went through it. Our God is for holiness. And if he's for holiness, we're for holiness. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart. So how do we live that out practically? Well, we know that the Bible says we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. So that's how we live our lives. we, We do not get into holy huddles. Do you guys know what a holy huddle is? You know what it is? Okay, we are not called to live our lives in holy huddles. It's when all the Christians congregate together and stay as far away from the unbelievers as possible. That wasn't God's plan. The Bible says we're called to be salt, salt of the earth. If you take a piece of steak and you put a little bit of salt on, it's delicious, right? It adds flavor. If you take the whole jug of salt and pour it on your meat, how does it taste? It's gross. It's bitter. And if we're going to sit in holy huddles, we're going to give the world that experience. It's like dumping the whole, we're called to be sprinkled out there. I want to challenge you guys this morning. Stop praying for a Christian boss. Stop praying for a Christian place of work. We're called to be out there in the world, not of the world, but in the world. Because if you leave your place of work, who's going to pray for your unsaved boss? If you leave your your place of work, who's going to invite your unsaved colleagues to church? It's our job. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're the light in the darkness. What else are we for? Well, we're for what God's for. And we just said that God is for being in the center of our lives. Jesus is our center. Jesus is our reason. Jesus is our cause. Jesus is our message. Amen? And we live lives that reflect that. Well, what does that look like practically? It means I get up in the morning and I seek Jesus. Jesus, what do you have for me today? We spend time with Jesus. We choose Jesus over Netflix. When we could be watching, I have nothing against Netflix. I love Netflix. But balance. We've got to be in his word, in his presence, because Jesus is the center. So our relationship with him comes first. Our time with him comes first. It's a priority. He's the center. You know, when I was, I think probably what I'm, I I love working for the church. And we also run a health center at our church now for vulnerable women and children. So I still get to do some medicine. But what I miss the most about my old job and my practice was I got to engage with non-Christians every day. And it was exciting for me. I would pray on the way to work. Like, Lord, um, firstly, help me to diagnose them properly. I don't want to hurt anyone. But then, Lord, give me discernment. Like, whose life can I speak into? Who can I invite to church? Give me opportunities. Lead me. I'd pray that every day. I would, I would pray it over my life. And, you know, I would invite people to church. At one point, Andre and I laughed. Our view group was made up. 80% of patients from my practice that I'd invited to church, they came to church, they gave their lives, they did growth track, and they came to view group. And you might say, ooh, wasn't that uncomfortable? They were in your, in your space, your privacy. Hey, I only get one shot at this life. I'm not really that interested in my privacy. I want to see people go to heaven. And if I have influence because I'm their doctor, I'm going to use it. So Jesus is the center. We make our decisions based on Jesus, not on what makes us comfortable, not on, not on what's convenient. And our focus is seeing people come to know Jesus, his everlasting love, his goodness, his salvation. And then thirdly, well, our God is for mercy. So then we're for mercy. We're rich in mercy. So at View Church Tableview, we've got signs up all over the place that say, come as you are. I don't know if you guys have, do you guys use that? So we always say, we're a come as you are church. We'll say this at Growth Track. I know you guys are also a come as you are church. You don't have to have the sign. But we'll say, look, we're a come as you are church. Come however you are. Because God loves you just the way you are. But then we'll say this. He loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. So come as you are, 
But just know that God's presence is going to change you, and he's going to move you, and he's going to mold you. But my point is, we're rich in mercy. Anyone is welcome. God can do anything in anyone's life, in the most broken person's life. I've also learned along the, along the journey to never say, oh, I hope they get what they deserve. I don't say things like that. Because I know that if I have to get what I deserve, I'd be in big, big trouble. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, I don't get what I deserve. And I get to stand up on the stage and I get to preach, but it's all because of Jesus. He is for mercy, so we are for mercy. In Exodus 33, we read about the Israelites becoming distracted in the wilderness. So Moses leaves for a few days, and without their leader, they get distracted, and they end up building a golden calf. You guys know the story. And they worship this golden calf. And Moses comes back, and he is furious. And God is actually furious with them as well. And he actually tells Moses, take the tabernacle out of the campsite. And the point is that they got distracted. They allowed themselves to get distracted. You see, distraction will always lead to division. You need to remember that even two visions is division. Two visions is division. Mono die. So if you're not staying focused, you're going to lose the unity. And unfortunately, whenever there's division, it leads to destruction. So it goes distraction, division, destruction. And the devil knows this, and he loves this. It's one of his favorite tricks. If he can just get us in the church distracted, he will. He'll distract us with a bit of an offense. He'll distract us with a bit of Skinner. He'll distract us with a little bit of bitterness. Why didn't I get that leadership role? Why am I not the leader of that community group? Why wasn't I placed in charge of that ministry? I feel overlooked. And as he starts to plant these thoughts and these seeds in our lives, we become distracted. We become distracted. We sow division. And destruction follows. And so practically, how do we stop this? How do we protect ourselves from going down this road? This is something I say to our church so much. And um, yeah, It's something I'm still working on, but God's helped me big time in this area. I say this a lot. I say, as Christians, we need to have the thickest skins and the softest hearts. Like, we have to be so difficult to offend. Like, literally, somebody says something offensive, it just bounces off you. You know what? They probably didn't mean that. Oh, the the intentions are probably good. Like, you just choose to believe the best. You choose to be unfazed. You have a thick, thick skin and a soft, soft heart. So when somebody does hurt you, you forgive quickly. The devil hates it when you've got a thick skin and a soft heart because you are very, very difficult to offend. Other practical ways communicate. Guys, just communicate. Do you know how much offense could be avoided if we just spoke to each other? Like, hey, what you said was hurtful. Or, hey, I just want to know, I would have loved that leadership role. Is there a reason? Just communicate. But don't speak to your whole connect group and, and leave out that one person that you actually have the offense with. That's just gossip. Go straight to the person and communicate. The devil hates it when we do that. The other thing we do is we guard our hearts. The Bible says guard your heart diligently because out of it flows the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. You might say to me, cool, Deanne, I want to guard my heart, but how do I do that? Because I've been through that. Like, how do I practically guard my heart? I'm going to give you just two tips that, that, I, that help me with guarding my heart. So the first is the armor of God. 
So I try to put this on every single day. I try not to forget. You guys know the armor of God, right? The shoes of readiness or peace, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, and the helmet of salvation. And every morning I say, God, I'm putting it on in faith. But what I do is when I get to the part about the breastplate of righteousness, and obviously that's meant to remind us that we're righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of his sacrifice. When God looks at me, Leanne, he sees the sinless, spotless record of Jesus. He doesn't see my sins. What a privilege that I can wear the breastplate of righteousness. But when I put it on, I say, God, thank you that this breastplate is protecting my heart. It's guarding my heart. It's keeping my heart soft and protected. So I will say that. I'll speak it out in faith. And then where it says you take up the sword of the Spirit. You know, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So if I feel like I'm starting to get offended, my weapon is the Word of God. If I'm feeling like I've been overlooked or I'm feeling sorry for myself, I go, hey, well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God is my promoter. The Bible says that the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. The boundary line says that if God is for me, no one can be against me. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. Jesus gave me everything, so nobody owes me anything. That's what the Bible says. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. I'm not going to get bitter. God will raise me up when he wants to raise me up. And you speak the word over your life and your, your whole mindset shifts. It's powerful. And something else that I do to guard my heart is I pray for the person that's hurt me. Because being in ministry, working in the church, unfortunately, you are, you are going to get hurt. I mean, like I say, I've, I've grown up with my parents. My parents are hysterical. They have like the loudest voices and they always think they're talking in private and like the whole house can hear. Anyone else got parents like that? I'm sure Cheslin, Cheslin's got a loud voice. I'm joking. I love you, Cheslin. <laughs> but seriously, we would hear everything. And my parents got hurt. And, you know, and they had to learn. Soft heart, thick skin. And, um, and I'm learning it too. And, I mean, I've only been on full-time staff for 18 months. And there's people that you will sow into and you will love and you'll believe in and you'll try and raise up. And then something happens and they're gone. And they're angry with the church and they're angry with you. And, and it's hurtful. And what I've started to do is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll say, God, I choose to forgive so-and-so. And I pray for them. God, won't you bless their marriage? Won't you protect them? Won't you bless them? Won't you help them find a new church that they get plugged in, that they can reach their destiny? I pray that they'll be all you've called them to be. I actually pray it over their lives. And you know what? In the beginning, it feels like I'm, I'm praying it and I don't mean it. I'll be honest. But the more you pray it, the more your heart softens and the more you mean it. So prayer is a powerful way of guarding your heart. Lastly, choose your company wisely. Please, guys, choose your company. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be fooled. Bad company corrupts good character. So I've said, yes, we need to reach out to our unsaved colleagues, but don't make them your bestie. I mean, you've got to have balance. If you're spending all your time with unsaved people, you're going to become just like them. Do you understand that, guys? It takes, a, it takes balance. Your closest friends should be godly people. Your confidence should be godly people. You should go to, for marriage advice to Christians. Don't ask your unsaved friends for marriage advice. That's just stupid. I'm just, for lack of a better word. Wisdom, go to somebody who's building a godly marriage. Get your advice from them. This is a true story. There was a lady who, a Christian lady who suffered from really bad migraines, really, really bad migraines, and she had a parrot. And if you went to the house to visit the parrot, the parrot would do this. If you engaged with the parrot, it would say, oh, Jesus, Jesus, help me, my head. It's so sore. Jesus, help me. Oh, Lord, Jesus, my head, my head. The parrot would yell like that. Who here knows that that parrot did not actually have a headache? (laughs) But who has your ear? Because when you spend enough time with someone, you start sounding just like them. 
Be careful who has your ear. There's a saying that says, don't just let anyone rent a space in your head. Make sure they're a good tenant. Make sure good tenants have a space in your head. Matthew 18 verse 19 says, again, oh no, sorry guys, I just, sorry, I want to read another verse. Matthew 12 verse 25, it says, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. A house divided cannot stand. So we need unity For this church to thrive, we need unity. For our country to thrive, we need unity. For your family or your marriage to thrive, you need unity. I said earlier that the devil's not scared of a big church. He's scared of a unified church, a united church. Why is that? It's because our God is so for unity. He speaks about it right throughout the Bible. He's so for unity. It's important to him. He wants us all on one big, great mission, reaching the world for Jesus. He didn't make it a one-man job. And because he loves unity so much, when we engage in unity, it releases the supernatural in our lives. That's what it does. And the devil knows it. Unity equals the supernatural blessing and favor of God. Matthew 18 verse 19 says, Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So that's a promise of God's supernatural intervention when there's unity. Amen. Matthew, sorry, um, Psalm 133 promises us that where there's unity, God commands a blessing. Matthew 18 verse 20 goes on to say, where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So it unleashes the supernatural favor of God. I don't know about you guys, but I need the supernatural favor of God in my life. I need it. I can't do this life without it. I need the supernatural favor of God in my marriage. I need it in my family. I need it in my church. I know we need it in my city. We need it in this country. We can't afford to do life without it. If you look at Genesis, it's like God picked up the importance of unity. I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this. But God first created Adam, right? And he said, Adam, I have a job for you. You you get to name all of the animals. And Adam was like super excited. And he started off and he was like, caterpillar, octopus, kangaroo. Like he was quite creative. And then it's almost like he got a little bit tired. And he was like, cat, bat, rat. (laughs) And then eventually he was like, bee. And I think God was like, okay, dude, you need some help. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to put you to sleep, and we're going to make a woman. You need a helper. You need some help. And so that's what God did. He gave him a good general anesthetic because I'm a doctor and a wife, so I know this. Men are not very good with pain. That's why we have the babies. And so he gave him a good general anesthetic. He put him to sleep, and he took out a rib, and he created Eve. And now he had a helper. And they could work side by side, together in unity. Different roles, but side by side in unity. And Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. You know, sometimes in life, we don't want to get too involved. We say, oh, gosh, you know, view group, people at my house, or I have to go out and deal with people and their problems, and oh, I just can't. Come on, you don't have to put your hand up, but I know some of you know what I'm talking about. And yes, with people, life gets a bit messy. It does. But I'm always reminded of that proverb, and I meant to look it up in the break. I can't remember which proverb it is, but 
But the proverb goes just like this. It says, an empty stable stays clean, but it brings in no profit. So you can keep your life clean. You can keep your stable clean, but it's not going to bring in a profit. You get people into your life. People who can pull you up when you fall down. People who can pray for you when life is tough. People who have your back when your marriage is struggling. People who can give you godly advice when you're struggling with your children. It's going to bless you big time. It's worth a little bit of mess. Amen? I'm going to end with the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a Jewish man. And he actually worked as a cupbearer for the Persian king. I know it doesn't sound very glamorous, like who wants to be a cupbearer? But that was actually a pretty cool job. You were almost like the PA to the Persian king. And Nehemiah was a godly man. And he heard that the walls of Jerusalem had, had been smashed down and that the gates had been burnt. And that the remnant of Jews were in serious trouble. And when he hears this, his heart just breaks. And the Bible says he cries out to God and he goes and he fasts and he prays for the Jewish nation. Firstly, who here would like a Nehemiah in their life? I sure as heck would. Where I'm going through a rough time, this friend goes and cries out to God on my behalf. He prays for me, he or she, fasts for me. I could sure as heck do with some of those in my life. And I know I'm called to be a Nehemiah to some people. Where are you going to find your Nehemiah? You're going to find them in this house. You're going to find them in your connect group. You're going to find them in your serving team. That's where you're going to find them. But what's so amazing about Nehemiah is he gets the order right, because a lot of us get the order wrong. He prays and he fasts, and then he goes with a plan. He hears from God, and then he has a plan. He got the order right. And so he, after praying and fasting, he goes to the Persian king, and he says, will you release me to go back to Jerusalem and help rebuild the walls? And he's got God's favor all over his life because he's prayed and he's fasted. And so the, the Persian king says, yes, you can go back, but I'm actually going to send you back with protection, with officers to protect you, and I'm going to send you back with provision. Here's some material to rebuild the walls. I want to make a point here, church. When you seek God, when you do things the right way, when you ask Him first, and then you do your plans, when you're in God's will, He always provides provision and protection. Come on, that's something to get excited about. He's a God who gives provision and protection. But when you make your own plan and then you ask God to bless it, it doesn't always work out the same way. Amen? So Nehemiah heads back. And you must understand there were miles and miles and miles of wall that had been smashed down. This wasn't a one-man job. This was a huge job. But remember, Nehemiah had prayed, so he had a God plan. And a God plan is always a team plan. It's a plan that involves unity. And so Nehemiah heads back to what looks like an almost impossible task, to the hardest thing, miles and miles of broken walls. And church, I know that there's people here this morning where you're facing challenges that just seem impossible. It feels like miles and miles of brokenness. And you're thinking, how the heck am I going to get through this? It might be your marriage. It could be your, your marriage is in a mess. It could be your finances. Maybe it's your mental health. I don't know what you're struggling with. But I want to tell you the way you're going to get through it is when you get into unity. A God plan is always a group plan. You need to get people praying for you, behind you, standing with you. You might even be overwhelmed by, the, by the, the state of our country right now. I was talking to Simon and Chesna, and it seems like you Durbanites are, are stronger than the Cape Townians because in Cape Town, it's been horrible. We've had so many people immigrating, which breaks my heart because I believe God has a plan for this country, and it's a good plan. And I, and I hate hearing about all these families in Cape Town who are immigrating. And about two months ago, 
a young man who grew up in our church. I knew him so well. He moved to Australia two years ago. About two months ago, he put a post on Facebook saying all the South Africans should run for their lives, and it's so much better overseas where he is. And, and then, you know, I read this, and my heart just broke. I thought, this is terrible. This is wrong. And I felt so sad. Then I started to read the comments, and it was all ex-South Africans just writing the most ungodly, terrible stuff. And I, then I read one post, and I believe it was righteous anger that I was filled with, but I got angry. This guy wrote there, he said, yeah, you know what, South Africa might eventually come right. But if it comes right, it's going to take a lifetime to rebuild. He actually used the word rebuild. He said, it's going to take a lifetime to rebuild. And I'm not prepared to give my life to rebuilding a country when I can just go somewhere else where it's much easier. And as I read this, I got so angry and I thought, what is wrong with this person? He's just living for his, his 80 plus years on earth. He's clearly not thinking about eternity. I was like, his attitude stinks. They can have him. They can keep him, that country. He's all theirs. Seriously. I was like, that's a terrible way to look at the world. And I never want to think like that. I want to be able to say, I stayed, and I prayed, and I trusted God, and I fought, and I rebuilt a nation. What an honor to be part of rebuilding a nation. Come on, guys. To actually say that I left a country better than when I was born in that country. Does that make sense? I was born into a terrible thing called apartheid, and then the country got tricky, and, and other things happened, but I fought to leave a legacy that the country would be even better when I left. I didn't run away. I didn't settle for easy. Come on, church. God didn't put you in this country by accident. He didn't make a mistake. And we are not called to live for our 80 plus years on this earth. We get one shot at living for eternity. I don't want to settle for easy. You know, rebuilding is often harder than building from scratch. Would you agree? Building from scratch, you've got a beautiful clean slate. You can put in your foundations. Rebuilding, there's rubble. There's dirt. Okay? There's hurt from the past. There's fears. I'm not saying that rebuilding is easy. But the only way we're going to rebuild is if we rebuild together in unity. And you know where it starts? It starts with God's church. We have to know this. God's plan for saving a nation was never through politicians. It was never through business investments. It was never through businessmen. God's plan has always been through the local church. And that is the hope of the world. He uses the local church. But we've got to stand up in unity and we have to pray and we have to trust God. And we have to say, we're willing to rebuild. We're willing to get our hands a little bit dirty. You know, Nehemiah got every tribe working on that wall. He got every tribe. There was a unity. And what seemed like a massive job ended up happening so quickly. You know, our God is always most glorified when he takes a situation that looks impossible and he jumps in and he flips it. That's when our God is most glorified. And we need to remember that. But Nehemiah got them in unity. One thing I want you guys to remember, though, is that when you rebuild, there's always going to be opposition. Okay? Especially, the devil doesn't want us living in unity. He wants us all fighting. He wants chaos. So there will be opposition. And Nehemiah had opposition. Go and read the book. There was an awful man called Sanballat, and he did not want the walls getting put back up. And he taunted Nehemiah, and he tried to throw them off track so many times. But again, Nehemiah prayed, and he came back with the God idea. And he said to his men, we're going to build with one hand, and we're going to hold our swords in the other hand. And we're going to be ready to fight. And we've just spoken about how do we fight. We fight with the Word of God. So when the devil comes at you, when people come at you, when people speak nonsense to you, well, what does the Word of God say? 
I'm going to fight with the Word of God. He's got plans to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. He will complete the good work that He started. You relate this to every part of your life. You relate it to the country. You relate it to your marriage. You relate it to your finances. You fight with what the Word of God says, His promises. We're called to rebuild. Divided we fall, but united we stand. Amen? I'm going to ask you guys just to stand to your feet. Because I want to pray for us. I'm going to ask you guys just to lift your hands to heaven. This is nothing weird. If you've never done it before, all this is is a sign of surrender. You're just saying, God, I surrender. And I want to pray for us as a church. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here, and I thank you that you are moving. And Lord, I want to thank you that you've got the most amazing plan for this country, God. I believe that we're going to be an example to the world of what happens when the church of Jesus Christ stands up together in unity, and they pray, and they stay, and they speak life. Thank you, Jesus, that you are going to heal our nation, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful country. Thank you for the plans that you have for it. Father God, I just pray for a fresh anointing of unity over this church, God. Over this church as a whole, that they move forward with one vision to see you glorified. And God, that that unity trickles down into their connect groups, their serving teams. That God, it trickles down into marriages, into families. That this is a church who is for unity, who believes in unity. A church that's okay with getting their stables a little bit dirty because they realize the value that comes from relationships. In Jesus' name, God, we pray for a fresh anointing, for a fresh touch of your spirit. We worship you, God. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Just while you guys stay in this attitude of worship, if you are here this morning and you're saying, you know, Leanne, I don't actually have a personal relationship with this God that you're talking about. Maybe you did, but you've fallen away from him. But you're saying, you know, I don't actually have a personal relationship with this God who you're saying has a specific plan for my life. This God who you're saying is rich in mercy who has my back, who goes with me in the toughest seasons. I don't actually know him, but I want to know him. I want to get to know Jesus. And I just want to pray with you this morning. And I actually want to do things a little bit differently. I want us to pray together in unity as a church. Can we do that? So you guys are going to repeat after me, and we're going to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for paying the price for my sins. I repent and I ask you to be Lord of my life. I thank you that from now on I belong to you. I am yours. I'm living for your purpose. I'm living for eternity. And I want to be part of building something greater than myself. In Jesus' mighty name.